Good, one, good morning, and welcome to the First Church Boston Sunday broadcast for December 11th, 2022. Welcome to the First Church in Boston. If this is your first time or your 300th time being here, you are welcome. Wherever you are on your religious journey, you are welcome. You can find a home here. 
Today, I, I'm, today I'm Edmund Robinson, just I was the same place, person I was yesterday. Uh, <laughs> today uh, we have a guest in our pulpit, Reverend Jane Dwinell, uh, who was, gave a wonderful workshop yesterday to the uh, members of the steering uh, search committee and other people interested. Uh, if you have a chance to catch that somewhere on, I guess you can't see it because it was on Zoom, but um, it was a wonderful workshop and I think we're going to be doing a lot more of that kind of work uh, in the future in this church. Um, I was very impressed. I'd like to start us out with um, a responsive reading. If you turn to 653 in the back of your hymnal, we'll find something that pulls in something of the spirit of this, these weeks before Christmas. It's called Reflections on the Resurgence of Joy. How short the daylight hours have now become how gray the skies, how barren seem the trees. Damp and chilling wind has gripped my mind and made me gloomy too. But there is that in me which reaches up toward light and laughter, bells and carolers, and knows that my religious myth and dream of reborn joy and goodness must be true because it speaks the truths of older myths, that light returns to balance darkness, life surges in the evergreen and us, and babes are hope and saviors of the world, as miracles abound in common things. Rejoice and joy in the gladness of Christmas. Our opening hymn, Number 147, when all the peoples on this earth, and as usual in this uh, sanctuary, if we're going to be singing, please sing through a mask. May the light of love be shining deep within your spirit. May the torch of mercy clear the path and show the way. May the horn of plenty sound so everyone can hear it. May the light of love be with you every day. Now I will invite you to rise for the First Church of Boston Affirmation. Words are in your order of service. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Thank you, please be seated. The announcements are few, they're in your order of service. Um, <clears throat> we have a need for 
performers and readers for the solstice service that will be happening right after this uh, service this morning. Uh, if you want to join in uh, and help us out with the, that wonderful service, which will be on the 21st, um, please stick around. Um, also, Christmas Eve choir volunteers, calling them um, Sijiji, our music director, if you want to be in the Christmas Eve choir. And Christmas, and Christmas Eve readers. We need readers and singers. We need everything. We need everything. <laughs> we need you. My, um, and my wife needs an audience. She's going to be performing at WGBH on Thursday. Uh, and you can uh, find out where and when by looking up WGBH's uh, website. So now we have our anthem.
now we welcome Ellie Miller to our pulpit to talk to us about gun violence. This Wednesday, December 14th, marks 10 years since the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Since that time, there have been more than 1 million Americans shot. The 45,000 total gun deaths in 2020 were by far the most on record at that point, representing a 43% increase from a decade prior there will be no school for Newtown children on Wednesday, since the local schools have repeatedly experienced so many threats on December 14th of each year since 2012. Mass shootings do catch our attention, but in reality, they are the tip of the iceberg of this country's gun violence crisis. They account for less than 1% of the persons killed by firearms Every day, over 120 Americans are shot and killed. Gunfire is now the leading cause of death for children ages 1 through 19. More people have died from shootings in our country in the last 50 years than were killed in all of the wars in which the U.S. has been engaged. As we have done in previous years, we'll light candles in remembrance of victims of gun violence and in the hope that we can shine a light on this tragic situation. There have been 28 gun homicides in Boston this year. I will name all of these victims as Rosemary and Joanne light candles for each. Juscelina Gomez, Drayshawn Johnson, Bilal Bell, Pimentel de la Cruz Jr., David Wood, Jordan Bridgman Dix, Ralphie Scott, Jahim Just Vail, Curtis Ashford, Roosevelt Thornton, Xavier Barcon, Dion Ruiz, Daryl Russell, Keandra Roberts, Demonte Dancy. Tefan Evie, Germaine Day, Hanser Moretta Gonzalez, Christian Berryman, Rosante Asorio, Quineru Goodwin, Danny Sanders, Jasmine Burrell, Christian Thistle Cabanon, Max Hilton, Jason Murray, Edwin Pizarro, and Elijah Pinckney. Just in Massachusetts, in an average year, 244 people die from gunshots. Over 100 of these are homicides, and 140-some are suicides. Let's light candles for them. 
an additional 688 Massachusetts residents have been injured by guns each year. Let's light candles for them. Nationally, more than 45,000 people now die from gunshots each year. Approximately 20,000 of these are homicides and 25,000 gun suicides. Let's light candles for all of them. Plus another 85,000 who have been injured by firearms. And let's light candles for those 500 killed unintentionally. Tina Cherry, CEO of the Lewis Brown Peace Institute has said, for every gun death, there are always at least 10 relatives and friends grieving and whole communities affected long term. Let's light more candles for our communities. The news on gun violence is too often not what we hope it to be. But it, it is heartening to know that in, in our recent elections, 140 candidates who were volunteers with the organization Moms Demand Action were elected to office all across the US. It is a relief to hear that the Newtown families who filed suit against gun manufacturers won their case this past year, marking the first time a gun manufacturer has been held accountable for a mass shooting in the US. Let's not forget those who have died, but also let's make sure that the number of victims is steadily declining in the years to come with the help of our determined advocacy. First Church in Boston was an early member of the Massachusetts Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, which now is comprised of over 120 member organizations. By working together with our police leadership, our legislators, and our community organizations, the coalition has become a leading influencer in strengthening laws, facilitating new partnerships, and educating the public. The coalition has been vitally instrumental in seeing that new laws have been written and are enforced. Thank you, First Church, for making a commitment 10 years ago to support this organization and its work. Well, that's a hard act to follow, but thank you so much. That was lovely. The readings this morning are from the Christian scriptures. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take that speck out of your eye, while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. And as Jesus sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the, the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with sinners and tax collectors? But when Jesus heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick do. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. John chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. Early in the morning, Jesus came to the temple. 
All the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and making her stand before them, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They said this to test him so that they can bring some charge against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one beginning with the elders, and Jesus was left alone with the woman. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. And finally, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, you shall love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Our next hymn is number 248, We Believe in Christmas.
the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. That is, if we're comfortable with their appearance. Our first principle, the core of our values, theoretically, but do we truly affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person? Or do we pick and choose among those that we approve of or are comfortable with? I'd like to share some things I've overheard or been told directly in my church, in my childhood home, and in some other situations. I was at a contra dance last night and a man kept asking me to dance. He had two left feet, crooked teeth, and an unusual accent. All the women were avoiding him. You have such a pretty face. It's a shame to hide it behind all that fat. I tell you if, you, if you lose 50 pounds, I'll take you to Boston and buy you a new wardrobe. She's only 24. What kind of life experience could she possibly have? She is way too young to be a minister. Oh, what a cute little fella. He's going to grow up to be big and strong, just like his daddy. We need more members, but of course we can't have just anybody. The first time she came to the house, I noticed she was wearing rubber thongs, and I thought, how unprofessional. Dyke, Leslie, come on, baby, I can show you a good time. Then you'll know what a real man is. Look at them, pierced everything, spiked leather collar, and he's wearing nail polish. Why do all the weird ones come to our church? Remember now, Jews only want your money. Don't play with those colored girls, honey, they're dirty. And Japs, I don't care how smart they are, they bombed Pearl Harbor and for that I'll never forgive them. I understand she has done great work with people in need, but her clothes, her hair, her weight, won't she turn people off and offend them just by walking in the room? Is everyone truly welcome at the table? Or are there little voices inside of us that stop us from embracing everyone and accepting them into our midst? What prejudices hold us back from affirming and promoting the inherent worth and dignity of every person? Our society is full of prejudice. I'm full of prejudice. It's ingrained in us from the earliest age. We make assumptions about people, often solely on their appearance. And we are often wrong. So I'd like to share a story with you, one of those life-changing events for me. I was a senior in high school, 1971. We had to do a special project for psychology class, and I had an idea. So I gathered up my supplies and drove 45 minutes to visit a friend at the nearest college, University of Vermont, a big school. I went to the library, an English textbook of my friends in tow, for five or 10 minute blocks of time, I went around the library and sat at different tables where students were studying. I opened my book and read and then moved on. I was watching for my table mates' reactions to my presence. The first time I went to the library, I went as me, which at that time, like many of my generation, meant I had long straight hair, blonde in those days, and I wore jeans and a t-shirt, sandals, simple yet clean and presentable just me. I smiled at my table mates, kept to myself as I studied. Nobody paid me any attention. Maybe a few folks nodded back as I sat and smiled. Most simply ignored my presence, table after table, throughout four stories of the library. The next time I went to the library, I took on a new persona. Still me, of course, but I changed my appearance. This time I went with greasy hair, ripped overalls and t-shirt, barefoot and a while since I had bathed. Fragrant and slovenly. Same textbook, same game plan while I wandered around the library. Approach a nearly full table of students, sit down and smile, open my book and read. At every table, every table, everyone got up and left. No one even acknowledged my presence, not even a disgusted look. They just got up and left. Okay, you can probably see where this is going. The third and last time I went to the library, 
I assumed a prep girl persona. Makeup, hair done, nice white blouse, plaid skirt, stockings, heels, perfume, discreet jewelry, clean and neat, walk around, sit down and smile, open book and read. At every table, I was acknowledged by everyone. Smiles, nods, some cases light conversation. Oh, I'm taking that class too, that sort of thing. Two requests for a date. I was stunned. It was still me, each time, whatever my appearance. Yet I was ignored, avoided, or acknowledged simply because of my clothing, my appearance. What depths are we missing in people when we don't move beyond the surface label? Woman, man, gay, straight, old, young, white, black, pagan, Christian, rich, poor, waitress, lawyer. What assumptions do we conjure up in our minds when we meet someone or see someone on the street? We see a supersized woman and what goes through our minds? She should lose some weight. Oh, I feel sorry for her. At least I'm not that fat. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful woman. We see a carload of young men of color and what happens? Automatic internal fear? I wonder what they're up to. What are they doing in my neighborhood? Do I look vulnerable? We pass by a homeless person who calls out, spare any change. We feel sorry. We offer thanks, we have a roof over our heads. We toss some quarters into their cup. What if we see the same person two years in a row, sitting in the same spot every day? When is she going to get her life together? I wonder how much she makes sitting here every day. I wonder what her life is like. Would we ever actually sit down and ask her? So I'd like to go back to the statements I made earlier and share the rest of the story. I was at a contra dance last night and a man kept asking me to dance. He had two left feet, crooked teeth and an unusual accent. All the women were avoiding him. When this woman continued her story, she went on to tell me that a group of people from the dance went out for coffee afterwards and this mysterious man was in the group. The women continued to be uncomfortable until people finally started talking. It seems that this fellow had a PhD in comparative religions, taught at the local university, and was absolutely fascinating. By the end of the evening, my friend had asked him out on a date. You have such a pretty face. It's a shame to hide it behind all that fat. I tell you what, if you lose 50 pounds, I will take you to Boston and buy you a new wardrobe. That was my mother 40 years ago. But to me, a woman who had spent most of her adolescence and adult life up to that point dieting to no avail, it was a devastating comment. She's only 24. What kind of experience could she possibly have? She is way too young to be a minister. This was heard in the halls of my seminary, the Star King School for the Ministry. Future Unitarian Universalist ministers working hard to confront our own issues, our own prejudices, and possible blocks to an effective ministry. Oh boy, yet ageism ran strong. Well, I'll tell you what this 24-year-old had to offer. She had an encyclopedic knowledge of the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew, having graduated with honors from Swarthmore with a major in religion. But more than that, she had a gift for worship and ritual for active listening, and for wholehearted play. She became my best friend there, even though I was almost twice her age. She was the person I turned to to help me through the rough spots. And I still do. Oh, what a cute little fella. He's going to grow up to be big and strong, just like his daddy. This was said to me about my daughter, Dana. <laughs> Even cute little bald-headed babies have assumptions made about them. Even dressed in pink, strangers in the supermarket assumed she was a boy, and they assumed my son was a girl. <laughs> anyway, as strong as her daddy, she and her daddy grew up together loving long-distance hiking, and at one point they hiked Vermont's Long Trail, and Dana was in bare feet. We need more members, but of course we can't have just anybody. 
I am not proud to say that this was heard at a church that I served when we were talking about growth. <laughs> Perhaps the speaker was bold to speak up and say what many people think but dare not express. It's often best to get our fears out into the open and face them. I find many Unitarian Universalists assume that potential you use must have a high IQ and a firm intellect, never mind a substantial income. But I think we would do well to look to our Universalist forebears who understood that the saving grace of their message was for everyone. The first time she came to the house, I noticed she was wearing rubber thongs, and I thought, how unprofessional. Okay, that was said about me. In my days as a hospice nurse in California, I thought it was California, you know, you could do whatever you wanted. Anyway, fortunately, my skill at nursing overcame my appearance and my fashion sense, and the woman went on with her evaluation of hospice service to say how pleased she was. Dyke, Leslie, come on, baby, I can show you a good time. Then you'll know what a real man is. The man was menacing, and he was holding a two-by-four. He was outside the local gay bar, which also held a first-class restaurant where my friend and I had just had dinner. Two women walking out of a known gay bar. We were a target. Whether or not we were actually lesbians, whether or not we had male partners, and we ran straight to the nearest police station. Fortunately, it was only two blocks away. Look at them, pierced everything, spiked leather collar, and he is wearing nail polish. Why do all the weird ones come to our church? Yes, this comment too came from a UU, and I cringed when I heard it. And I watched this young couple embrace our faith and embrace church life. I watched as they came every Sunday, as they pledged 10% of their very low income to the church, as he developed our sound system and our website and handled all our computer problems. She eventually chaired the RE committee and then sat on the board. Their three kids considered the church to be home. And the parents still remained pierced, spiked, and polished. Remember now, Jews only want your money. Don't play with those colored girls, honey, they're dirty. Japs, I don't care how smart they are, they bombed Pearl Harbor and for that I'll never forgive them. These comments were from my parents. <laughs> Growing up in Vermont, the whitest state in the nation meant automatic prejudice, simply out of fear of the unknown. The first family of color moved to my town in 1970. If the man hadn't been a high school teacher, they probably would have been run him out of town. My parents never had an opportunity to face their assumptions about others. The only others we had were the Catholic French Canadians. Jewish people didn't even exist, except in mythology and stereotype. I met those dirty colored girls when I was with my family on a trip. We were staying at a motel in Arizona and the girls and I were playing on the playground when my mother called me back to the room. I didn't understand. They didn't look dirty to me, and I was having fun. But it was obvious my parents were quite upset, so I didn't argue, and I stayed in the room. And how was I to know that the Japanese culture holds a rich source of faith traditions as well as ordinary people like my family who only wanted to live in peace? The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were portrayed as heroic moments for our country with no respect or honor for the country that was devastated, at least in my childhood. Things are better. Interestingly, though, later in my father's business career, he spent several weeks a year in Japan and embraced the Japanese culture and her people. It's amazing what a little first-hand education can do, even for very racist Vermonters. I understand she has done great work with people in need, but her clothes, her hair, her weight, won't she turn people off and offend them just by walking in the room? This was heard at a congregational meeting, voting on whether or not to ordain a longtime member who had gone to seminary, passed successfully through the ministerial fellowship committee, and was asking to be ordained by her home church. Simple, right? Apparently not, for this person was transgender, and the negative comments clearly reflected people's discomfort with this area that they did not fully understand. A discomfort with her appearance alone, 
not her skill at pastoral care, preaching, or teaching. Time to breathe. Why is this so hard? It seems just when we work on our prejudices and assumptions in one area, it's time to move on to another area. Sexism, ageism, racism, heterosexism, classism, sizeism, genderism. The list goes on and on and on. Wouldn't it be easier if everyone was just like me? No? We live in a world blessed with difference. Like a lush and vibrant flower garden, we each add our beauty to the whole. How boring it would be if we were all marigolds or zinnias or roses. Our differences add depth and richness to our lives. We have so much to learn from each other through our gifts, the telling of our stories, the simple perspective of a childhood in a different culture, in a different place. Inside, in here, lies our wholeness as people. If we do not take the time to look inside each other, our lives will be less rich. If we make assumptions about another based on appearance only, we might miss out on an opportunity to know another heart to heart. Like Jesus, who reminded us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to cast the first stone only if we were without sin, we can welcome everyone to the table. In fact, I believe our faith calls us to do just that, to put aside our assumptions and prejudices and reach out for each other. Let us make a place for everyone here at our table of Unitarian Universalism. Let us create the world we wanna see. Let us bring wholeness and joy and conflict and trust and beauty here to the table. And let us truly affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Amen. We'll now receive the morning offering for the advancement of this church. If you'd like to support the work of this church with a financial donation, you may write out a check to First Church Boston and mail it to 66 Marlboro Street, 02116. You can also donate via text. Simply text the dollar amount to 617-917-5610. You will receive confirmation by email. Thank you.
something a little bit like call and response that you experienced the other day when Matt Myers was here where people used to call to each other in the field or people would sing hymns and it was a way of teaching a hymn. If you look in the back there is the words to Healing River and I want you to repeat after me. Hello. 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 Oh it's working. Okay. <laughs> oh Healing River. Send down your waters. Send down your waters. Across the upon this land. Upon this land. River. Send down your waters.
stand up for this part. <laughs> this is the fun about traveling around and visiting other congregations, because you don't ever know what people do. Anyway, it's been delightful to be with all of you. Uh, it's been really fun, and I wish you well in your ministerial search. The closing words, the charge to the congregation today are by Edward Everett Hale. I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. Blessed be, go in peace. Feel free to join us live each Sunday at 66 Marlborough Street at the corner of Berkeley Street in Back Bay. If you'd like more information about programs, services, or membership at First Church, please visit the website www.firstchurchboston.org or send an email to office at firstchurchboston.org. Thank you.